It started with our state legislation discussion. Uh, we do have a um, couple of items here to address. I also want to announce that Council Member Jawando and Katz are absent because they're attending separate funerals. So we missed them, but um, we will begin with um, discussion on some of the outstanding items. I know that also Ms. Myhill had sent my colleagues, all of us, uh, some bills as she is polling on certain positions and it would be really um, important for her to get everybody's responses uh, today so that she can communicate that over. So in case you haven't seen those, I'm sure she will be happy to talk to you right after to make sure that you uh, express your um, desired position on those. So with that, let me turn it over to Ms. Wenger to walk us through um, our packet. Um, I do want to say that there's also an income tax, child independent care tax credit alterations that she's going to talk about. Um, in the past, this council is always very supportive of this, of course. Um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And if I have an opportunity on Wednesday, as I'm going there to testify on school construction, I'll be happy to also deliver testimony if my colleagues are in support. So that will be added to this discussion. Okay, Ms. Winger. Okay, so why don't we just take that one first? Um, it's a piece of legislation that increases the state's um, credit to support um, child care expenses. Oh, and, and I also want to acknowledge that we do have Delegate Plokovich Carr, and uh, as is, she has uh, communicated, um, it's awesome that now we have basically liaisons from our state delegation that come and visit with us. So welcome, and uh, really appreciate your service. Okay, let's let's proceed. So, is everyone supportive of having the state increase its credit for? Thank you. Support. Can you move the mic a little closer? Yeah. Sure. All right, I hear no objection with uh, supporting um, increase in the income tax challenge, dependent care uh, tax credit alterations. Um, everybody's good, so okay. we'll work on that. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, so this, the, what, what was the first bill in your packet um, relates to eminent domain and what I call the traffic relief plan. And it's a piece of legislation, Senate Bill 781. It's cross-filed House Bill 663. Um, if you look at the piece of legislation, it's very short and sweet. It's all uncodified language um, that um, prohibits a state agency or its designee um, from acquiring residential real property um, for a public-private partnership um, that adds toll lanes to I-495 or I-270. Uh, the county executive does support this piece of legislation. Um, but I believe Mr. Or Mr. Orland has some, some comments um, from the council staff perspective. Okay, Mr. Orman. Thank you. Um, there's some problems with the bill, the way it's written. If, there was, if it's revised, it would, I think it would be fine. Uh, first of all, it, it says it prohibits any acquisition of right-of-way. Almost all the time when you build a road project of some kind, uh, you, even if you're staying within the right-of-way for the final road, you need to have right-of-way just beyond the right-of-way line for construction easements, temporary easements, if you're building a sound wall, if you're building a retaining wall, if you're actually even having to just to store equipment uh, during construction. Uh, these are revertible easements. They go back to the property owner once the, the, the construction is done and the, and the property is restored to the way it is. Uh, my reading of this law means that even if you, you couldn't even do that. And even the simplest of road projects usually have construction easements. Secondly, um, the main concern that I've heard, we've all heard, about widening 270 and the Beltway is the impact on whole strings of houses and not just whether they're taken or not, but if they're, even if just their yards, much of the yards taken, it really reduces the value and the livability of those properties. But for any kind of a major project, it's very common that there will be some individual a house here, a house there type of thing, which um, uh, would need to be taken. Otherwise, the impact is too great. Um, and thirdly, uh, the master plan calls for hot lanes, or allows for hot lanes, which are toll roads, uh, on 270 and the Beltway, the western part of the Beltway. Uh, and the way this is written, does that mean that uh, if there was any kind of these impacts that I mentioned under the first and second comments, then we really couldn't even do that, even that's something we want. So my recommendation is that the bill be amended uh, to be able to accommodate to, you know, re respond to these comments I'm making, and then it would be fine. But but I think the way it is is too strict. 
Okay, thank you. Councilmember Hucker. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm glad to hear the verb you just used, Dr. Orland. I was mm -hmm. prepared to um, argue strongly that we need to be very much in support of this bill and that you don't oppose a bill like this on technical grounds. Um, all of those objections are, are, I think, well well said, and they all are ripe for amendments uh, to allow for construction easement, to allow for a limited amount mm -hmm. of land, to allow for um, scoping the bill down to especially just focus on 495 west of 270, um, or east, east of 270, where we're all mostly concerned about. But a bill like this that's consistent with our position um, and consistent with our desire to have more local control and supported by nearly our whole delegation and important Prince George's allies, I really think we need to support um, with, the, with those amendments uh, would be fine, but we certainly can't oppose it. Yes. Council Member Reamer. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate your analysis, Glenn. I think the amendments are quite important and it's kind of the difference between a good bill and a bill that actually creates some problems. So. Um, I, I think that we want to argue for the amendments and support the bill, but actually work hard to get the amendments because uh, it could be problematic if we didn't get the amendments. I think that the broader issue here is one that we really need to step back and, and focus on, which is what's the council's strategy with this entire project and what is our position? There is an existing master plan that was crafted in 2010, I think, 2009. Uh, that addresses um, an approach to the corridor, but um, I, I think that we need to uh, revisit our council's position and our county's position on this project and get a little bit more creative and a little bit more assertive. What's going on right now, it seems to me, is sort of a, a series of obstructionary attempts um, when what we ought to be doing is thinking about what we want and how to get what we want accomplished. Um, there has been a lot of talk about BRT to Northern Virginia, and uh, Glenn, you've, have, you've worked on that over the years. Uh, there's a, a very interesting series on GGW right now about the need for more suburb to suburb transit. To me, the risk of this project is that the governor basically says, well, we, we created this project and there's hot, line, hot lanes, and, the, and you know, if you guys wanna run buses in the hot lanes, you can, and that's transit. And that is not what we're going for here. We need to push them very effectively to build a real transit system. Um, for example, one that has special ramps, as Glenn, as you've outlined, and, and uh, you know, enables us to build a really high quality BRT connection from Clarksburg and through Gaithersburg and Rockville and Bethesda to all the jobs in Northern Virginia, which is where a lot of people in Montgomery County are in that commute. And it's, a very, very painful commute and it's only gonna get worse. And I think the risk to us go over the long term, if we don't have a strong transit connection to Northern Virginia uh, is, is very significant. I think that it could cost us a lot not to have access to those jobs. And, you know, national landing, this doesn't really help much with national landing, in my opinion. Uh, national landing, the real solution there is a mark run through, in addition to the Metro improvements, is a mark run through to National Landing, but Tyson's, really, I think you need a BRT connection through, from Montgomery County where it's in, it's in a fast lane, a, a hot lane. Um, and, and we can do that without uh, changing our basic strategy of stay within the existing right-of-ways um, and that there, the tolls are only allowed on, on new lanes, not on existing lanes. Um, so I think we can put all of this together, but I feel like we need to uh, refine our position or step up and, and articulate a position. And uh, Chairman Hucker and I, have, we've been talking about a resolution um, and we, we need to continue that conversation. Glenn, can you talk to us about what the timing is from, the, from our general perspective on this project and, and where we are in this whole process? Well, as you probably know, the state about a week ago, or maybe it was two weeks ago, put out what they call their screened alternatives, which is a subset of the um, uh, initial alternatives that they released last summer. Uh, these screened alternatives, are, I think there's six or seven of them, 
um, and they want to boil it down to even smaller number, but they're not ready to do that yet because they're still doing some traffic analyses and some other environmental analyses. And they hope to have uh, a decision on the smaller set, which are called Alternatives Retained for a Detailed Study, or ARDS, by sometime later this spring. I'm not, don't, there's no date that I've seen, but I'm thinking probably sometime in April. Um, and what you're talking about, Mr. Mr. Reimers, in terms of what the uh, council might want to, or the county might want to try to in, and put into this, uh, into these ARDs, are some of these concepts you talked about in terms of uh, improving mark um, service, like through routing mark, but also beefing up the parking at certain mark stations and uh, bus shuttle connections to them, more meet the mark kind of service, mm -hmm. uh, as well as these uh, special ramps from uh, four or five. Um, crossings of 270 uh, so that you can have regional BRT, but by the way, would not really compete at all with the, uh, with the more local BRT, which is what is currently being planned on 355, just as it isn't really that um, competitive with Metrorail. So there are like, three uh, things that can independently stand. The idea would be that the public-private partnership has to pay to build these ramps and then fund the bus service, the BRT service, from the toll revenue. That's, that's the initial concept. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism as to whether even the current uh, scope of what the state states or the governor's talking about is supportable by tolls. Um, you can only right. go so high with tolls before people don't use the, the thing at all. Right. Uh, so you have to find that middle po uh, point where that, the sweet spot where you can get the most revenue. Uh, um, but even that, I'm not sure will pay for uh, many of the things he's talking about. And we are talking about things on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it probably would be some kind of mixture of a P3 with an, uh, with an availability payment type of thing, just like we have with the Purple Line. Right. Um, so You think yeah. that's likely? Well, I would like to uh, continue the conversation with uh, Mr. Hucker, and, and we can come around to council members and talk about you know, a resolution or a letter, something where yeah. we can articulate this yeah. and, and get on record and early enough to hopefully have an impact. Right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Council Member Rice. Well, uh, Councilmember Reamer, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that's a strong point. Um, getting back to what you started off talking about, which is there seems to be sort of a disconnect, and so I'm happy that uh, Delegate uh, Polakovich Carr is here um, because I want her to hear and certainly transfer back um, that I, I'm not sure where we went astray in terms of folks understanding the importance and priority of 270. Um, as a person who lives uh, in the Germantown area, whose residents continue to struggle each and every day as they commute uh, to job centers that are to the south, uh, unfortunately, it seems as though this particular legislative session, there have been people who have forgotten uh, that people don't have access to mass transit in the up county and that somehow I-270 and improvements aren't important. I do understand strategy. I've been there in Annapolis for four years, and I certainly understand uh, the governor's uh, surprise proposal when it came to I-495, but to conflate two huge road projects together and then somehow make it seem as though uh, they're both bad and need to be uh, uh, s somehow uh, derailed or slowed down or, um, is, is, is crazy to me. And so I have to say that, you know, when I see bills like this, they trouble me uh, because it shows a lack uh, of understanding and compassion for people who are struggling each and every day. It's a reason why I wrote the letter that I did uh, that talked about uh, some of these very things. If we continue to put roadblocks uh, for the people who we're asking to help to pay for because we can't pay for it and we continue to have to tax our own residents, your residents, uh, over and over again to pay for these projects and to ask the state and the federal government to help us with those. Uh, but if we're then saying, oh, wait a minute, uh, we're not gonna do this because we're concerned about this or that or that. Um, and this has been a number one priority for the council for a very long time. I I'm, I'm just so confused. So um, Dr. Orland, I'm very happy about uh, the amendments that you put in that uh, would ensure that something like this happens, but I'm just gonna be on record in saying that I'm very concerned about the spirit of which uh, folks are attacking I-270 and the improvements on I-270. 
Um, I haven't heard any concerns from residents about losing their homes. Uh, in fact, the majority of right-of-way has already obtained for the widening of 270. Uh, and we have long since said that high occupancy toll lanes were what we wanted to see as a council over and over again and given that to not only our delegation but to the governor. And so then to have something like this just flies in the face of what it is that we care about. And so, you know, it, it, it's getting to be a bit much for me uh, in terms of having to continue to explain to my residents why uh, we have local elected officials that are continuing to put obstacles in the way uh, of I-270 moving forward. Again, I would prefer that they, in future legislation, separate I-495. I certainly understand the issues there. Um, but even then, the only thing that we as a council advocated for was American Legion Bridge, which everybody is in agreement with needs to be fixed. So um, we've been very clear about our priorities. So I'm not sure what folks are trying to get at. But um, I do support uh, the position of support with amendments. I appreciate Dr. Orlin highlighting those for us uh, and putting those out there. And I'll make sure that I bring this up with MACO on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have a question for Mrs. Wenger. Um, this is the third or fourth or fifth bill related to I-270 and 495, so can you bring us up to speed as to where all the other pieces of legislation are and how this might work or, or not work with, with those pieces? I think that this is standalone. It's, you know, very clear, very simple piece of legislation. Um, there are a lot of, there are a number of other P3 bills out there. Um, this is, you know, P3 is a procurement mechanism and it's, um, it's state statute that um, is being drawn on for the traffic relief plan. Let, let me re rephrase the question. Um, as it moves through the legislative process, not the mechanics of each piece of legislation, but just the, the politics of bill passage, where those are in, in the process. Okay, a um, number of the P3 bills have not been heard yet. Um, obviously, you're familiar with House Bill 91, um, which dealt with the pre-solicitation report. And if you followed that, um, that was due to be before the Board of Public Works several weeks ago, and it did not go there. Um, and then there's this bill. So I think, I will tell you, I think there's, as a result of House Bill 91, I think there's a lot of discussions going on in Annapolis. Um, with the Maryland Department of Transportation about this project. Um, but uh, there's been nothing specifically related to it that has passed so far or has actually even been reported um, out of a House committee. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Reamer. Thank you. Um, appreciated the comments that we just heard. I just want to, you know, again express we believe that transit must be included in this project. And that's part of what this is about. We believe that this project must stick within existing right-of-ways. Uh, and that really speaks to Councilmember Rice's comment. Mm -hmm. The existing right-of-ways on 370 and from 370 to the bridge are about 300 feet. And we believe that it is possible to add the capacity that's being discussed within that boundary. Yeah. It's a different case on the Beltway towards Silver Spring. Right. Towards Silver Spring, it's only 200 feet in many places. This may not fit there. We, we not, but we shouldn't back off of, you got to stay within the boundaries. And I think that's, you know, so we've got to balance these different constituencies that are hearing kind of one message, which frankly is a little bit about the Beltway to Silver Spring. And I, so I'm, I, hear, I hear you there. Um, but, you know, sticking within the boundaries is a position that works well for both sides of this infrastructure investment. And yet, we don't believe that that's enough. We actually want transit to be a real part of this project and not fake transit, not just you can use the lanes, but actually really funding something meaningful and, and operating something meaningful. And there's no reason why we can't get that if we get on our game and, and go advocate for that. Yes, Mayor Friedson. Thank you. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been said. I uh, actually met with uh, Secretary Ron and uh, SHA Administrator Slater and made very clear the right-of-way issue for uh, both projects. I guess two weeks ago was, I think, the day 
of, but before the announcement that the transit was going to be uh, dropped, unfortunately, uh, but did at least on a personal level as the district one council member where has a lot of affected residents uh, made made that uh, clear. Um, but I do have some questions about the mechanics of this, just speaking to uh, council member Rice's questions from a lobbying on our behalf and reflecting exactly what um, uh, Councilmember Reamer you know, mentioned as in terms of being proactive and not reactive in terms of what our position uh, is, where do we go from here? Because it seems like on a lot of these bills, particularly with supporting with amendments, we're not supporting with amendments that have been proposed. We're saying that we'd like amendments to happen so that this wouldn't be a, you know, a, a, a bill with unintended consequences from our perspective. So what are the mechanics now? We have the county executive is supporting. We would be supporting with what we would consider to be amendments that we would like, as Dr. Orland mentioned. Are we sending a letter with specifically what those amendments are? Are we going to request that members of the delegation introduce these specific am amendments or the, the, the bill sponsor introduces these amendments? I mean, where do we go from here? Because I'm a little concerned as part of the way that we do the state ledge process that we have a discussion up here, a very thoughtful discussion about uh, nuances of policy making in terms of amendments that we would like in order for the bill to be what we desire, but then what the next step is of that process. I'm not sure I am clear, particularly in a case where the county executive may or may not agree with what our uh, interests are in terms of those amendments. So we'll write an official county position statement. We will write on your behalf and you know speak to the committee about your position on this piece of legislation. Um, on occasion, there are disagreements between the county executive and the county council. It's not uncommon. And we'll make certain that um, the committee and our members on that committee are aware of the positions of both. So in this case, I will tell you, I will go back to the county executive with the set of amendments that were uh, that I believe you all are going to support and see if you know we can get on the same page if we can't well in that county position statement there will be you know, it will be very clear um, uh, you know what the county council's position is and it will include um, a draft of that set of amendments that you are um, supporting in order to support the bill it's a condition of your support and the county executive will you know will figure out how, how to parse um, um, his position on it as well. But, Madam President, sorry, but can I request that we get a copy of those amendments in that letter and you have a chance to, to weigh in individually if, 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 if appropriate? Sure. I mean, that's all, that's all public documentation and, you know, I'll get you the set of the amendments bef before they, you know, actually I think this bill's being heard tomorrow, so Right. I mean, I, I don't know that we have time to get everybody to chime in. I, th I mean, I don't know if I think Dr. Orland was described very specifically what the amendments are. Um, so to the extent that I'm hearing that we would support with amendments, uh, so if that yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. We'll work together this afternoon on what sure. those amendments look like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely we can circulate it. I just. And if we can't get the specific detail correct, yeah. I mean, I'll make sure certain that I convey um, what the concept of those amendments would be. I mean, I think that that's very clear. Yeah. So, okay, so to That'd confirm, I think that what I'm hearing is that we would like to support with those amendments. Is that correct? Any objection to that? Okay, you guys will work out the specific language just so we can just details. see it, but mm -hmm. I think that the yeah. majority of the council, I think it's unanimous for those present, wants to proceed with support with the particular amendments that Dr. Orland had described in terms of that language. Yes, it's my home. Uh, Thank you. I just wanted to address what Mr. Friedson was referring to. And a lot of times when there are amendments that the council has requested, OIR works with the council staff analyst or attorney to draft those amendments. Um, you often don't see them, but they are reflective of your position. Yeah. Trust. <laughs> it, it, um, just trust. Well, I think that what we are expressing is that, of course, we would rather see those amendments. But I will also have to remind all my colleagues that whenever there's a time limitation, just like there are still you know, positions that Amanda is waiting for of bills that she circulated last week, 
there's also the timing issue. So I think we're having the session to signal the support and signal that we support these amendments, but sometimes we're not gonna have time to just circulate and edit even further. But I think as a matter of practice, we do need to get that language regardless, just so that everybody sees it. Okay, next bill. Okay, uh, next is um, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Um, this is a, a, a big initiative of a coalition that's been created. Mr. DeMarco is um, one of the spearheaders of that. And there was a piece of legislation um, that was deemed to be unconstitutional. So I think that this is a piece of legislation that's coming in to help support the cause of greater transparency mm -hmm. on this issue. And I'll let Leslie talk about the bill. Okay. As you can see, it's supported by many, many members of the House of Delegates. As Melanie just said, it's also supported by a number of county executives. Um, so not very controversial. Um, what it would do is create a five-member board um, that is supported by professional staff, and they would review prescription drug prices and set upper payment limits um, should they determine that that is appropriate. There's also a stakeholder council that supports the board um, that would also provide input. All right, I uh, don't see any lights. I think this is great. So without objection, I think we're in favor. Okay, um, the next, you've got quite a lot of information about what is on the <coughs> county's priorities list as, you know, a perennial, <laughs> one of the top two or sometime the top one, public school construction. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, um, you have the details of each one of these bills I'm gonna kind of gloss over because we would, could be buried in more detail than you want. It is there in your packet. Um, if you decide you want to um, go line by line and uh, understand um, every nuance of these three pieces of legislation, but I'm going to generally tell you uh, what's going on here. So uh, the administration, the governor, um, I think you heard him in December or November, uh, decided to advance an initiative that is familiar to those of you who have been on the council for a while because it reflects um, not only the Baltimore City mm -hmm. initiative from 2013, but also an initiative that Montgomery, Prince George's, and Baltimore County banded together with in 2015 for a, a similar mm -hmm. plan to help accelerate their public school construction programs. And what it involves is, um, is the, rev the uh, Maryland Stadium Authority mm -hmm. issuing revenue mm -hmm. bonds um, in order to, um, of, of sorts, again, jumpstart larger school construction programs through a much more significant state commitment, state financing commitment uh, to building out and renovating schools in Maryland. So the governor's bill um, and what I'm going to call the supplemental bill are, are nearly identical. Um, with the exception of they both allow the stadium authority to issue about $1.8 billion in additional debt, just raises their debt limits accordingly. Um, the, in order to implement this type of a program, they create a couple of funds. Those funds are naturally named in, in different manners. Um, and then um, what is significant difference is the source of revenue to pay the debt service on the revenue bonds. Um, in the administration bill, that source of revenue is the, is the education trust fund. Um, as you know, there was, as a result of the constitutional amendment passing that dedicated, that will ultimately dedicate um, all of the funds specifically to K through 12 education without allowing supplantation in the state general fund. Um, there was um, the first installment of the result of that constitutional amendment passing was about $125 million um, additional money to the Education Trust Fund. The governor tags that money. Um, he is able to do that. Uh, it was not separated out as only operating money. It was just for use of public K through 12 education. He tags that money as the source of, um, the revenue source to pay the debt service on the, the, the bonds that the stadium authority would issue. The supplemental program is structured in an identical manner, different names of the funds, of course, um, but it uses um, a diversion of state lottery funds, which is identical to how the Baltimore City program does work now. But there are differences in the Baltimore City program, how it works. Um, I think one of the easiest ways to think about the administration slash supplemental bills 
are that it would, the program would operate largely like it does now. It's just on, and projects would queue up through the Interagency um, Committee on School Construction, and those matches would be the same. Um, the couple of, couple, one difference there is in both of those bills, um, the state is enabled to pay architectural and design fees, which in the, uh, what I'll call the traditional, the base program, um, that is not the case. Uh, but the matches are the same. Um, it's, it's inferred that the process would be the same, um, except that now, certainly under the traditional program, school systems are managing those projects. Both of these two pieces of legislation allow the IAC to um, create a waiver for school systems that are able to manage their programs. So you could mm -hmm. assume that a school system, the larger school systems like Montgomery, uh, Prince George's, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel would uh, receive a waiver like that so they'd be able to uh, manage their own program and the state of authority would, would not manage that program. Mm -hmm. So um, those are really kind of the key differences. That, but the, the program would, it's revenue bonds versus general obligation bonds. Mm -hmm. Um, and the projects are identified on a project by project basis, and then they will just queue up through the system in that manner. So, and the source of funds instead of, you know, state property tax revenues, mm -hmm. which are dedicated to debt service in the state budget, this would be either the education trust fund or state lottery fund diversion or something else that might mm -hmm. be identified. Mm -hmm. So very similar, but it does um, allow a significant new state commitment to helping to partner with subdivisions, particularly places with significant enrollment growth or, you know, and, and the vestiges of huge enrollment growth that places like Montgomery County have had to try to at least not just run a place, but try and at least stabilize the situation and actually maybe make a little bit of progress. So those are those two bills. And then there's also a Montgomery County only bill. Um, I'm not certain what the future of this bill would be, um, but it's structured a little bit more similarly, like the Baltimore City Public School Construction Program from 2013, uh, for obvious reasons, because it's, they're both were unique to one county. And um, one aspect, a couple aspects, I mean, the Montgomery County bill um, has some things that would probably need some work on. It infers a two-to-one match instead of a one-to-one -one match. I think we would want to revisit that. Um, also, it does include the very significant um, change that is important, particularly this year, and that is the, I'm going to call it the supplemental program that was passed really as a, in a reaction to the fact that we were not successful. The three counties were not successful in 2015 uh, advancing a Baltimore City public school construction style of initiative for themselves. The next year, and this was largely the Montgomery County delegation, was successful in creating a supplemental program for school systems that met certain criteria relating to significant enrollment growth and the number of relocatable classrooms that they were utilizing. Um, so the Montgomery County only bill, it's not entirely Montgomery County only, it includes a provision in the bill that mandates um, that that funding requirement be increased from $40 million a year to $100 million a year. So that's what you have. Okay. Um, the county executive, um, he is, um, of course, very, very supportive of seeing a, a more significant state commitment in public school construction. Um, I would note that um, certainly the education community is uh, concerned about the administration bill because of its use of the um, education trust fund. Um, so that has to kind of work itself out. And as an alternative to that, there is what I'm going to call the supplemental bill um, that does exactly the same thing, really, but uses a different revenue source for that purpose. Got it. Okay, Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Madam President, and uh, thank you, Mel, for that great uh, in-depth description. Um, uh, I will just say that for, and I have to remember which hat I'm wearing now in Montgomery County, not MACO. Um, it, it, because we've discussed these bills uh, at MACO as well, or at least two of them. Um, the initial bill for us doesn't make much sense with the introduction of Senator Zucker's uh, bill uh, for the Maryland Stadium Authority. So my suggestion would be that while 
again, we don't have to oppose. We could certainly just not take a position on the governor's bill, uh, but support uh, the public school construction bill uh, with uh, Senator Zucker. And then the public school construction bill that deals primarily with Montgomery and with other school systems with significant growth, we should, of course, strongly support that, even though it benefits us. I mean, obviously, we want bills that benefit this jurisdiction. And so my suggestion would be to support um, these bills, uh, the SB 731 and HB 727, uh, with some amendments. There are some concerns that MCPS has particularly, and unfortunately, I don't see. Uh, I just had a meeting with uh, Dr. Smith this morning, and he had alluded to some of those concerns. Some of them are uh, uh, actually addressed in the newer version of the governor's bill. He was reacting to the governor's bill versus Senator Zucker's bill, but there's still a couple little caveats. They're not big, um, but would suggest that when we have bills like this, that we also talk to MCPS to make sure that we've got their input or for whoever uh, the uh, particular uh, department is that's being affected by this so that they can weigh in and give any suggestions in case they have feedback. And then um, with regards to, again, HB 668 and uh, Senate Bill 641, um, this is just a, kind of a no-brainer for us, similar to uh, the, you know, uh, great uh, bill that was passed before that gave us additional school construction for uh, enrollment growth. And so, um, we need to strongly support that bill. Uh, it's one in which it benefits not only us, but I think Baltimore County and Arundel, there are a couple uh, jurisdictions. So it's not just a Montgomery County bill. It actually uh, is a couple jurisdictions would qualify. And so this isn't just us. It's something that actually affects more uh, jurisdictions. So that's, that's just kind of my take on it. And again, I just think that we just need to be very careful about the SB 731, HB 727, with uh, some of those just very technical uh, amendments. And I have a text message in, so hopefully I might hear something before we're done with the conversation. I appreciate those thoughts. I have to be honest. Um, I think that this is such an important issue for us here in this county in terms of doing whatever we can to try to secure additional dollars that at this stage of the game, I am more inclined to support a statement that the accounting executive has sent over, understanding that you know if we get to that point in time where we can chime in with more specifics, I'm sure the Board of Education will, on technical um, particulars, et cetera, then we get that. But I, I just worry a little bit about where we are vis-a-vis -vis the need and the backlog uh, and hopefully the odds that we might get something that I would rather be supportive generally of this effort, um, keeping in mind maybe many of the things that have been described, but just strategically, that that's just, you know, that's where I feel. Councilmember Fietzen. Thank you. I just had a quick question. I think I share a lot of what has been said, particularly how important this is. My appreciation for Senator Zucker, who's really taken a you know, a leadership role in trying to make this happen and, and has really done a, a great job and I've been communicating with him regularly. But uh, the the Baltimore City uh, program that this was loosely based off of, pretty closely uh, based off of, of leveraging uh, money and having the stadium authority oversee it, part of that plan also had the stadium authority actually constructing the schools. Um, which would be different, you know, overseeing the public school construction program uh, itself for those funds with that additional money. My my understanding is that wouldn't be the case here. This is just be a revenue stream. I just wanted to make sure that that is right. accurate. That's what I was describing to you yeah. earlier. The way that um, that in the administration bill and the supplemental bills, while I'm describing them, um, the stadium authority is in charge of construction and management, except for the fact that the IAC may grant a waiver mm -hmm. for those subdivisions who have the capacity to manage their own projects. Right. Got it. So that is one, of, not, not just the 50-50 or dollar for dollar split, when, and the two for one you know, clarification, that is a fairly substantive difference in addition to the revenue source, which 
Right. Yeah, There's, there are definitely differences here. Uh, in fact, the Baltimore City program actually, there were specific reven there are specific revenue sources that the city was um, required to contribute towards debt service. And the, the administration and supplemental bills are really structured slightly differently. I mean, I would describe them as just think of it as on the traditional program, it's general obligation debt. Under this, it's, it's revenue bond proceeds. So it's, it's just a different revenue source. But it, they're structured fairly similarly with also that kind of nice feature where the state can pick up your architecture, your, your planning piece of the pie, mm -hmm. where you know, under the traditional program, um, counties have to pay that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, just want to get the sense from my colleagues. Um, again, I, I think that the general statement in terms of really welcoming any additional funds, uh, it's, it's where we should be. And then we will work on you know, particular technical things as they come up. Um, but I think just general statement is right. an important thing. So without objection, I think right. that's what we okay. will do is concur with the executive's um, right. statement. Right. And I, w I want to tell you, too, that you know, we're in very close touch, particularly with yeah. our fiscal people. So um, they're heavily involved in the discussions here. Um, they hear you. They've actually heard the county for years. Um, it's just um, two of you have been in the legislature. You know how difficult some of these types of lifts can be. Um, and so we're, we're very, very close to them. If there are technical details, if there are details that we need to work out, we're going to work those, we will work those out. Um, yeah. Any, okay. any piece of legislation, we'll, you know, we do, we're close to them, we'll work it out. Great. Anything else? Hopefully most of the time. <laughs> yes. Anything else? No? Um, Colleagues? I don't have All anything right. else. Oh, so. Council Member Hooker. Okay. We won't spend time on this, but I just wanted to bring to my colleagues' attention um, House Bill 1281, which um, has a hearing March 7th in appropriation, sponsored by um, Delegate Learman and um, is a priority for WABA. Uh, I'm sure I can get a second from Councilmember Reamer. Second. And uh, would fund a state a bikeways program and get a little bit of money to make ONMML to give guidance on that. So it begins with about four and a half million dollars uh, in 2021, goes to 7.7 .7 by 2025. I imagine all of this is before it, but in the interest of practicing what I preached at the retreat, I'll send over a, uh, a quick memo so people can take a look at uh, rather than taking a position on a bill they haven't read. Right, we're Court. back again next Monday, so we can get on the agenda and we can actually look at the bill and take it up in this process. Terrific. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.